Welcome, emergency departments across British Columbia. Sign your charts. You've reached your end of shift. You're listening to End of Shift, the podcast brought to you by the BC Emergency Medicine Network. I'm your host, Eric Angus, along with my friend and colleague, Joe Hagert, bringing you an eclectic mix of clinical pearls and discussions about the philosophy and practice of our craft and yours, emergency medicine. This is episode number seven of End of Shift, emergency department nursing as frontline as it gets. We're going to be talking to Louise Pick. She is an emergency bedside nurse and patient care coordinator at the Lionsgate Hospital in North Vancouver. But before we get started, Joe, I have a question for you. Fire away. The triage nurse comes to you with an ECG and tells you that the patient the tracing belongs to doesn't look very good. Do you, A, note that the computer ECG interpretation is normal and tell the nurse you'll get to it later? B, say that it's getting close to the end of your shift C, scrutinize the tracing and go see the patient. Or D, get out your calipers and say words like brugada, scarbosa. <laughs> well, I guess the answer to any question like that is it depends. It depends on if the eMERGE physician really values uh, his relationship with that nurse and the rest of the team. So I think most eMERGE physicians would totally value the nurse's opinion that the EKG doesn't look good and would look at the electrocardiogram and would go see the patient and probably with the nurse and uh, start a course of action, whatever it is. Like say it's a STEMI, start moving the patient to the right place and get the right treatments going and so on. The unwise eMERGE physician would just ignore it and say, it's, oh, it's the end of my shift. I'm not going to see that. That would be, that's the unwise eMERGE physician. So there is your answer. So I'm not an expert in body language, but when you said answer C, Louise was nodding her head and smiling. And then when you brought up the alternate answer, there was a bit of a crease of the brow and some scowling. So, but it is true. I'd say C is the correct answer. So we're going to explore the dynamic between emergency physicians and nurses and how to best cultivate this relationship, talk about challenges in emergency department nursing, and also talk about the art and science of nursing. So here is Louise Pick, and she's going to tell us a little bit about herself. Hi, my name is Louise Pick. I'm an emergency room nurse at Lionsgate Hospital. I recently started a position um, as a patient care coordinator in the last month. I've I've been an emergency room nurse for the last 10 years. I went to McGill University and then started my career at the Montreal General Hospital in the emergency department there for about five years. And then quit my job, went traveling for six months, and then the mountains were calling, so I moved out west. You're skipping rather quickly over your ski racing career, Louise. Can I hear a little bit about that? I used to ski race at a high level. I started when I was like a little kid and went all through. I ended up having a bad knee injury, blew my ACL, MCL, tibia plateau fracture. And then after that, I reevaluated things and realized maybe the Olympics aren't for me. So I moved on and then that's how I ended up going to McGill for nursing. Despite those knee injuries she's talked about, the last time I went skiing with Louise Pick, uh, somebody was waiting down at the bottom for my sorry ass. Anyway, <laughs> all right. So, well, I mean, not that as a competition, but I do believe that I am the best skier at Lionsgate in the emergency room. <laughs> all right. So, I think I do not know enough about nursing education and training. Can you tell me, Louise, just about the training and education that emergency nurses get? Because we just make assumptions about what you learn and maybe how that differs from what other nurses get. Tell us the breadth of your training and education so that we all know what, what you, what you have in your heads. So the majority of nurses that you're going to be encountering these days have a bachelor of science in nursing. At one point, you could get a nursing degree at a college and they still have that in Quebec. You can go to Sejep and get a nursing degree in Sejep. 
And then beyond that, it really does vary province to province. After you get your Bachelor of Science, it's like your general nursing degree. Um, as far as specialty areas, um, it does vary by province. So for myself, after I graduated from McGill, um, there's a school of thought that says like you, you shouldn't work in an emergency room until you work on the ward for, first. Uh, but in Quebec, for for whatever reason, perhaps sh staffing shortages, they do hire new grads straight out of university into emergency departments. And so at the Montreal General, um, they had this program called Genesis, and that's how they supported the new grads to work in an emergency department, which meant some intensive mentorship for about six months, as well as um, education days that were facilitated by the educators that worked in the emergency room. And you only worked in certain areas of the department. You weren't working with critical care patients, et cetera. And you had a lot of follow up with your manager, making sure that things were going well, et cetera. But in BC, they do a BCIT certificate in emergency room medicine. So I'm not sure in the other provinces, but th those are the two that I know of. Is the employed student nurse program still going? Like my daughter went through um, um, nursing and got her degree. And I think in her last year, she was like an employed student nurse and uh, was hired in an emergency department. Um, and then because she'd worked already so much in the emergency department, she was hired straight away uh, into the eMERGE. And I think she could only be in certain areas initially until until she took the final BCIT eMERGE course properly. I think that's how it all worked. I think we have quite a few at Royal Columbia too that are um, like they're sort of general duty nurses that are in part of the eMERGE and they, you can't go into the trauma room, for example, until you get your specialty, uh, your BCIT course. Yeah, we call it like they're identified as med surge nurses. So most of the time they've come from a medical or surgical unit, and they don't have the BCIT certificate as of yet, but they're hired to the emergency room, and they have specific scopes of practice that they're uh, that they have that we have to respect. And so, yeah, generally speaking, it's like no telemetry monitoring, um, no high acuity. So, for example, like they're obviously more than capable to take care of it, like a, a stable medical admitted patient. But I don't think they're they're also um, not within their scope to be assessing like your primary like emergency room assessment when, when a like when a patient first arrives in the department. So the next question would be about histories, physicians versus eMERGE nurses. And sometimes, like at triage, for example, the patient gives a history and uh, then the history is probably redone again after the patient's been triaged and then there's a different history. And then there's a third history taken by sometimes a student and sometimes there's a fourth history taken by um, the phys emergency physician. And sometimes these histories are quite different. Why do you think that could be? Because the patient is on trial. And did you or did you not say? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to take this moment to uh, do a did you know. So anyone working with Cerner right now, there's a did you know that Cerner only allows you to put in a 250 character um report for your triage note. So basically, you're only allowed to put in a Twitter's worth of information in your triage note. So anyone working with Cerner, if you're finding that the triage notes that you're reading seem brief and don't really capture exactly what was going on, you know, you went in the room, you did your assessment, and you're like, that's nothing what was on that triage note. It's because Cerner actually limits us to 250 characters. <laughs> You'll have to tell some people, because a lot of people in the province don't have Cerner yet, so you'll have to tell us what Cerner is. Cerner is a EMR that they're trying to roll out in the whole province. Yeah, it's gonna. I know it is going to hit the whole province eventually. Um, is it voice activated, or do you have to type it yourself? The, so nurses don't have um, voice activated charting. We have to do it on a keyboard. Oh, so basically when somebody comes in to, say, Lionsgate, you're going to be talking to them and then typing it like very, not the same time, but very, very soon afterwards, kind of what, what they're saying. And yeah, sometimes at the, well, sometimes at the same time, for sure, you're trying to be efficient. What do you do if you're not a touch typist? Does that discriminate against some of the triage nurses that can't have to look down and do two finger type? 
I'm like a proficient two finger typer while looking at a patient. Really? Yeah. Huh. Maybe three. How about you, Eric? Can you, are you a typer? Can you type fast? Joe, I've never typed and I rarely type unless I actually have to. I use our voice dictation system almost exclusively. Do you proofread your notes afterwards? Diligently. So I actually used to type really fast. I took typing in high school and um, I used to type all my kids like their essays for them. And I was like between 60 and 90 words per minute uh, typing. So I'm a touch typer, so I could probably look at the person yep. and type at the same time. But of course, I don't do triage and I don't have Cerner. Joe, I don't want you to ever talk to my children again. I don't want to hear any of that nonsense about, Joe used to type his children's essays for him, Dad. <laughs> do you tune their skis too? And yes, I can. I can definitely tune the skis. I've only ever worked with EMRs, so that's what I'm used to, honestly. <laughs> Okay, we've digressed away from Cerner, and we're still trying to get to the tough question, why Why do patients seem to give different histories to nurses, residents, medical students, and eMERGE physicians? I think a lot of the differences also have to do with the difference of attitude. I think that's what uh, most nurses could relate to, emergency room nurses. Perhaps ultimately what they're there for is to see a doctor. That's what their expectation is. And so you're just a stepping stone on their trajectory to see the doctor and get their diagnosis. So you often get the patient that's exacerbated. They don't want to elaborate with you. They don't want to give you the details. They don't really see the point in giving you those details. And then uh, ultimately they go see the doctor. The reason I asked the question is because, and it's not because it happens a lot, but I, because I depend a lot on the triage nursing history and the bedside nursing history to at least be a springboard for stuff I want to ask. And it's very rare, but sometimes I'll walk out saying, hey, that patient is complaining about chest pain. And the nurse said, wow, for sure, they told me it was their belly pain. It doesn't happen very often, but I just wondered why, why that sometimes happens and whether you had any insights. But I can see that. I can see perhaps the patient is tired of talking to a student and then another student and then finally getting around to talking to the bedside nurse and the physician. Eric, don't you think we're lucky in that um, we go to see a patient, and I'm probably like you, um, the first thing I do is sign up for it on the on the computer. The next thing I do is I go onto the computer and I look at all the previous records, or at least the most recent records, or any discharge summaries. And then the next thing I do is I look at the chart, and I've got on the chart, I've got like the vital signs, I've got a paramedic note, maybe. I've got um, the triage note. I've got another note by the nurse. They may have even talked to me. Do you not feel like they've done almost all the work for us pretty much? And so we go in there and like we're kind of like, like I, I think a, the smart emerge doc is like going in there and they've got all this data already collected and they just have to ask a few questions. All the work's already been done uh, for you. I see that some of the time, but actually sometimes I deliberately won't look at a lot of the past history because I guess I don't want it to flavor exactly what's going to be the patient's history for me. And so I see what you mean. You're right. We have access to a lot of good data, past medical records, discharge summaries, and also the nursing notes. But sometimes I walk in clean just to kind of see exactly, not have any biases, but... Yeah, I'm going to bet if we surveyed eMERGE docs, I bet you that probably half to two thirds would really read really well through the nurse's notes and in the, in the, in what they their history. But I bet some don't. What do you think, Louise? Not to bring it back to Cerner, but I do think that Cerner has been challenging for that. The uh, physician documentation is very clear in the system. It's easy to find. It's easy to read. But I'm sure you experienced this. The nursing documentation is really convoluted. It's hard to find. It's hard to read. And that has been a real challenge. I think a odd positive outcome that has come for that, I think that's increased our um, communication, like verbal communication between staff because the physicians uh, can know it's, it's hard for them to go and read that note. You can't really find it in the system. And so now you're like obliged to go have that like verbal communication with your colleague to see what's going on. Oh, hey, I'm about to go in that room. You know, 
you know, what was it that the patient needed so far or whatever? What do you think, Eric? Isn't that interesting that it's in an effort to get systems more plugged in and in this electronic thing, it's actually probably stimulated more conversation between doctors and nurses. I think that's interesting that it's, it wasn't meant to do that, but that's what happens. It was our workaround. All right. I wanted to ask you, Louise, uh, Malcolm Gladwell is a famous author. He's wrote, written books such as Tipping Point, Talking to Strangers, and Blink. And in Blink, he talks about type 1 thinking, which is sort of that fast, intuitive thinking, and type 2 thinking, which is slow, conscious, deliberate thinking. Is there a type of thinking that you think nurses use the most, or is it a simple blend, or are there ones that, is there a style of thinking that emergency room nurses use and prioritize? I think all emergency room nurses are obliged to be type one, but wish they could be type two. I think you're right about emerge physicians as well. I think a lot of us are, have type one type thinking. Um, I also refer to that as like brainstem thinking or algorithmic thinking. So a lot of stuff is very binary when you take a history and it's either this or it's that. Sometimes it's even nicer to ask, the, like you like to ask the question open-ended questions, but sometimes certain patients, they can't never answer. So sometimes you're stuck answering them binary questions, which can only be answered yes or no. And if you go down one path that leads you to further things, it's much more efficient that way. Yeah, I think it's out of necessity that you end up becoming a type one thinker because, you know, the fast pace of the emergency room and you got to get this done so you can move on to the next thing. But I think to provide that more patient-centered care is the type two thinking. And, you know, sometimes we just don't have time for that. Yeah, I do emerge and trauma. And it's interesting, um, trauma in the emerge, it would be type one type thinking. Um, emerge In the emerge, it would be type one thinking, but trauma on the ward is quite different. Eric, you do trauma as well. And that's a good example of the uh, slow, more conscious thinking, more holistic perhaps, where you, ha- where you can actually spend half an hour with one patient. It's totally different, right? Like I'm going to guess that a hospitalist or an internist would be much more of the type two thinking than perhaps eMERGE staff. And we eyeball patients too, right? Like you guys do that all the time, right? You all eyeball a patient. And that sounds like pretty corny, but you can tell if a patient's sick just by looking at them usually. And the vital signs, of course, will help a bit. Yeah. And this is where we were talking about the art and science of medicine and the art and science of nursing when that's I think the art of nursing and that that's not something necessarily that you can learn in school it's one of those things that you learn over time and with experience where that you just look at the patient and you can just tell how sick they are and um, that goes back to um, then you go to talk to the doctor and you're like you know vitally they're good but I don't think they look good. Yeah, we have one nurse uh, whose name is uh, Berinder. And, you know, Berinder will come up to you and say, Joe, there's a really sick patient, and we must do this. And I always say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. You know, because you can tell she's very, very experienced. And I think uh, many, many, many um, eMERGE nurses, uh, the longer they're, they are there, the better their judgment gets, and you just got to trust them. Mm-hmm. Your intuition. All yeah. right, so emergency nursing, if you had to pick the kind of style of thinking you prize most, it's that kind of type one thinking, that kind of fast, intuitive thinking so that you can also get through the bulk of the patients in the ED. And that stuff just grows with uh, grows with experience. All right. What do you think the biggest challenge right now would be for emergency nursing that you see at Lionsgate, but it's, I'm sure your answers could probably be generalizable to uh, most emerges. Probably, obviously, an aging population, higher acuity, more complex patients. Um, this, we're discharging patients sooner from hospitals and they're bouncing back and there's... Um, all this focus put on primary health care, but is all those resources in place for patients right now? Not really, especially now with COVID. You know, we're having a lot of patients come through the emergency room who cannot get in with their GPs 
Um, they can't make an appointment or they can only Zoom with their GPs. And so it's just uh, a lot of patients are turning to the emergency room now for their primary health care when we're supposed to be modeling something where that they're supposed to be taken care of in the community with their chronic conditions and those conditions are not being taken care of anymore. And now they're ending up in the emergency room again. So obviously like increasing volumes and increasing acuity and then coupled with the pandemic and staff themselves getting sick and having to call in sick. And so that putting another burden on staffing levels. Yeah, I was talking to my daughter and she was saying that the uh, sick call rates risen from the average of about 3% in eMERGE nursing up to about 11%. And that um, at least at her hospital, um, they're often short staffed uh, just because there's so many nurses at any given time that are off. And um, it's difficult, especially those who have kids, because if their kid is sick themselves and they can't go to daycare, then they have to take time off. So that, that's another reason to take time off as well. I think that's interesting that when I think of the challenges in the emergency department, I thought perhaps you were going to say something different, Louise, but those are almost, those are our same challenges. Because I think to myself, what are the challenges? It is, it's the aging population. And these are people that, you know, 30 years ago, they used to die. But because of great health care, people are now walking around with ejection fractions of 13% and on a couple of different immune modulation therapies, people that are really sick and they come in. And so we have this aging population and um, trying to look after the folks and trying to get people home and out of hospital. Those are the challenges we face. And so they're, they're identical to the kind of challenges you talk about. What about... Um... This goes along with the same kind of vein uh, is um, nursing morale and nursing uh, retention because I work at Royal Columbian and I mean, I love our nurses, but we do have a high turnover of nurses. And um, after a period of time, morale seems to drop and it comes in a cyclical, cyclical manner. And do you have any insights into what could, what is the problem? Like why, why is the morale sometimes low and how do you make it better? Well, I guess anecdotally, I could use an example that we've recently gone through at Lionsgate. Starting in 2018 into 2019, um, we went through a period of uh, changes in our leadership. So we had, I think, counting the interim managers and the managers, I think we had about seven and we also had a change in directorship. And that had a huge impact on morale. I've been emergency nursing for 10 years, and those two years were the hardest of my career. And I remember doing a lot of personal reflection during that time and trying to pinpoint you know, exactly what it was that was bothering me, um, what was within my control and what was out of my control. And uh, it, it really had to do with the impact of the leadership and how if you don't have strong leaders who are prioritizing the well-being of their staff, that has a huge impact on staff. The emergency room is a hard place to work, but people choose to work there for a reason. I think about sometimes when, um, you know, you have that night, night shift where you get back to back to back traumas. You don't get a single break. You don't get to go pee, but that's why you do it. You know, that's why we do this medicine. And that's the kind of like work that it's hard, but I don't mind. I feel like that's what I signed up for, but it's when it's the work where you're three short in the department and you're asking for more staff and they're refusing to call in more people in and there's no flow in the hospital and you have patients that have been admitted and they're waiting in the emergency room for 70 plus hours and you have three NCCU patients who you know are supposed to be getting stroke care and you have the waiting rooms full of stretchers. That's the kind of um, that's this kind of stuff that I don't think people kind of signed up for. And that causes a lot of moral distress for staff. They know patients aren't getting the care that they need. And you feel like you're failing them, which is just causing this overall moral distress for staff. Yeah, this is like you're, you're basically probably speaking verbatim what many nurses have told me as well. Um, and I think Royal Columbian uh, is one of the more crowded emerges. I know Surrey's terrible. VGH is terrible. 
Well, almost any urban emerge is terrible. I, I even think some of the rural emerges are starting to uh, get the terrible overcrowding problems um, as well. But it certainly has hit, I think, every single um, urban uh, um, emerge. I mean, I think we should really give a shout out to those uh, to the, um, the managers of the um, emerge. They should really realize what huge impact they have. If they're a good manager and they can improve morale by supporting there are nurses. That is just huge. And we did the same thing. We had a bunch of managers that were, um, we have a good manager now, but um, in the past, maybe less so perhaps. And it's amazing how they, the nurses just get demoralized and leave with, with uh, a lot of turnover of managers. So it's actually, it's critical to retention, I, th- I think. Yeah, we um because of the transitions that we are going through and the challenges that we are having over those years, um, one of the outcomes was a unique opportunity where the psychological wellness of the staff was surveyed. And one of the outcomes of that uh, was the acknowledgement that frontline staff really should be part of the decision making when it comes to um, flow and access and staffing levels and education. And there was, I think about 30 areas that staff identified that could be improved. And they decided to pick the top three areas to actually form working groups with our frontline staff. And the three that were identified by staff were flow and access, education, and, um, mental health and substance abuse. And I think that's, I was really moving, for me to realize what it was that was identified by my colleagues, you know, it wasn't staffing. It wasn't like, I don't get my breaks. It was, um, I want more education. I want better flow and access. And I want to be able to provide better care for mental health and substance use patients. And I think that's pretty amazing that it was ultimately just staff saying, I just want to serve my patients better. And I want the tools to do that. So I'm definitely taking a bit more of a positive and hopeful approach to things. I think things are finally improving for the better right now at Lionsgate. I don't know, Eric, if you have thoughts on that. Well, I was just thinking, too, about nursing morale. And I think it's really telling that the source of poor nursing morale wasn't these patients are so sick and uh, I don't like my colleagues. And it's not all that stuff that I think people might initially think of as a cause of bad nursing morale. It was, I can't provide the care I want to. And you're telling me that you want to improve the lot of the patients around you and your, and your, and that's, that's interesting. That's the morale we need to improve. And a lot of this stuff, I think just highlighting that, um, valuing the opinions and the feedback and the experiences of frontline staff is very important. And, kind of like a more grassroots way of approaching these changes and less of like that top down heaviness. And it just makes people feel more valued and it makes them feel heard. And, you know, maybe today we couldn't get the staff that we needed, but people felt like their concerns were heard by, by managers, by PCCs. um, And then you have, it kind of makes everyone feel like, like you're working a little bit more as a team. If you had to give some words to the eMERGE physicians out there, what would you say to them to help improve um, nursing morale um, in the emergency department? Well, when we when we were going through these periods of changes, I there were a lot of the physicians started to like you said, you kind of you start noticing, you know, the the morale in the department and they became advocates for us, which I think was really important. Yeah, I've been I've been trying my best to, um, you know, as best I can to get to know our nurses like quite well and to sit and have small conversations about this and that. And it's amazing how often you have something in common that's not medicine. Well, like Louise and I and Eric both are into backcountry skiing, and I'm sure we're going to go skiing sometime this fall or this winter. That's just an example try to give good feedback after big resuscitations to try to, I think that, I think debrief, I think debriefing after big recesses and making sure that the whole team, including the nurses and the physicians are all involved after, 
after most big recesses. I, that's, I, I feel that's a good morale boosting thing as well, as well as a quality thing too. I think that's something that Lionsgate might be famous for, infamous for, is uh, the level of um, bonding that we have amongst our physicians and our nursing group that we go rock climbing together, we go backcountry skiing, we go mountain biking. That we we go inspect breweries too. Yes, that is on site brewery mm-hmm. inspections. Yes. yes, yeah, we do brewery <laughs> auditing. <laughs> yeah, I think at Royal Columbia we're attempting, uh, and actually I think we're succeeding. We're doing very similar things. Uh, and I think when you you talk to a new staff, they do mention that as like a big part of the retention as well. And I think when we were going through um, these really challenging years, a lot of people. Um, referred specifically to the f- relationship between the physician and the nurses as a reason that they were going to stay and that that was a unique relationship that they hadn't found anywhere else and that was actually um contributing to our retention rates was the team it was like things are very bad here like there's some pl- things that could be improved upon but um you know i'm sticking it out because it's a, such a great team and I know people don't really want to listen to us talk about our backcountry skiing trips and <laughs> all of our rock climbing and stuff like that. But it's more than just that. It's also, um, you know, we a lot of staff have gone through some personal, personally tragic things in the last couple of years. And um, it's amazing and moving the way the team stepped up for them. Eric, I know you, you know what I'm talking about. Like there's some people have had some personal losses and just the GoFundMes and the meal trains and the going to do yard work at these people's places. It's, it's kind of more than just, just going, uh, going out for a bike ride. It's like a culture of a family. I like to think, and it, it's a big family. Um, but that's the culture. I think if you can somehow make your team feel like you're part of a big thing, like a family, and that that if you weren't working there anymore, it would be a tremendous loss. Um, that's how I feel, actually. I was debating recently about whether to retire or not. And I'm actually not going to because it's my family, another part of my family. I really It, mean, it means so much to me to interact with the Emerge nurses, uh, unit clerks, uh, aides, uh, and my other colleagues. I mean, that's probably why I'm going to carry on just for probably the next five to 10 years because it's, it's my family and it would be a huge loss to me not to, not to keep working. So um, I think that's probably a huge message is if you can somehow make it like your emerge as part of a family and think about how you could make it better for everybody, that would be a super good take home message for some of the people out there. Probably most are doing it anyways, I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, it's just one, that's one piece of the puzzle, right? There's, what you what you have control over, um, what's the the things you have control over as far as the morale, but there's also um, that's not exempt from the responsibility of higher level leadership in the hospitals to also take responsibility for the psychological wellness of their employees. So it's that Venn diagram. Well said. It sounds like you're saying the bond between docs and nurses is forged not just at work doing complex cases together and looking up for each other and doing simulations, but also just doing stuff outside of work, whether it's recreating or also just pulling together and doing that stuff we talked about, say, for one of our colleagues who's having a rough patch. And that makes me think about Louise's rough patch that she actually consented to tell us about. I want her to tell us a little bit about a very challenging day she had, not at work, but a challenging personal day. And thankfully, she was in the company of her family that Joe's talking about. And I just think it's a great little vignette I want to hear a bit more about. I don't think Joe knows what I'm talking about. No, I I don't know. Let's hear it, Louise. So it was in January 2018. We decided to do a backcountry ski trip. There was about eight people from Lionsgate, all friends, and then I think like three other friends of friends. We decided to go to the Wendy Thompson hut, and this is not a backcountry ski podcast, so I'm not going to get into the minute details. 
Um, but essentially, uh, we, uh, even though we were a group of 11, we broke up into smaller groups to uh, do our actual runs. I was in a group of three with two of my friends and um, we ended up getting caught in a size two avalanche. I was carried about 200 meters and fully buried and my other friend was carried about 100 meters and buried up to his neck. Our third friend wasn't caught at all and he basically uh, saved my life um, by finding me and unburying me. That's an amazing close call and your life was saved by your friend. And my colleague. Yeah, I basically, as soon as they got me out of of the snow I just was like in shock obviously so I just was like I just need to get back to the hut I didn't even realize that I had a gastroc tear at the time I didn't realize for about three days later um yeah your adrenaline would have been running probably yeah big time can I ask (laughs) um do you remember everything do you remember being under the snow and do you remember being hearing the shovel coming and the probe and do you remember all this stuff um I remember I remember I was able to keep myself above the snow for the majority of the ride. And so I had this instant when the snow started to slow down that I was like this small moment of relief. Like I did it. Like I was like, you fucking did it. Like, and then I just turned up and there's this second wave that just like. Oh, right over top. Yeah. And so I wasn't expecting it and I wasn't able to um, get my hands up in time. Yeah. So I, in the moment, my instinct was actually to put one hand above my head but I didn't bring one towards my face. And so I didn't have anything to clear out my airway. Um, so um, I could feel the snow moving over top of me. And then when it stopped, it was what it was the worst part um, because it created the vice grip, like what they talk about when it turns to cement, that is real. Yeah. And I, it basically put a vice around my chest and I couldn't even like, inhale even a little bit and then it was like fully up in my mouth and so like that and I think it kind of dawned on me the situation that I was in and so I didn't yell or scream I just remind myself that no one was going to be able to hear me anyways and just started to try to do some mindful breathing even though I'm sure I was hyperventilating I was like trying to go to that zen place and reassure myself that people were coming for me and then I don't remember much after that Um, apparently my hand was sticking out about this much above the snow. I did manage to get a couple of my fingers out. So when, um, Gabe came down, um, and found me with his transceiver, um, and started to look for me, he saw a bit of my mitten above the snow and was like, please say her hands in that mitten, which it was, he could feel my fingers inside. And so they were able to find me without having to probe. So I think that was really what made it a fast recovery. Wow. That's an amazing story. I think it's interesting that you had that experience with two of your friends and colleagues, but then probably last week you just went to work and they were working alongside you and you were looking after somebody and the patient probably, of course, had no idea that you'd shared this tremendous experience. And I think that that's interesting standing beside someone that you've gone through something like that through. And I bet you're thankful to work with. Exactly. Um, I, I wanted to know, I mean, it's a team environment in the Emerge and, um, we do some big, big recesses, um, and some amazing saves and it's definitely a team, but, um, I wanted Louise's opinion about what happens when the recess is not going well. And in particular with the Emerge physician, if she sees something that's not going right, like maybe there's not good leadership happening or there's some critical errors that are being made and how would the what would she recommend to her nursing colleagues and perhaps to emerge physicians too to how to deal with the recess that's not going well um i think a good pre-brief helps to hopefully avoid some of those challenges and then once the recess has started you know, people, you need to be confident, but also humble and realize that if someone's asking you a question or bringing up a concern, it's not a personal attack. Um, 
suggesting perhaps a recap at some point is also helpful. That's something that we do a lot at Lionsgate that I uh, really appreciate um, because a lot of the times, especially now, again, with like staffing shortages and the problems with AGMPs and the kind of staffing levels that you need of that, you're kind of having a lot of people like, you know, the call the call goes out that we need more hands in a recess and people are arriving at different rates and they might not know what's going on. And so in taking that like minute to do the recap of like, this is the patient, this is the situation, this is what we've done so far, this is what I want to do. Does anyone have any questions or concerns or feedback? Um, that's really valuable, I think. Eric, what do you think? No, I, I'm, I'm waiting to summarize. You keep on going. You're doing great. <laughs> Uh, so that's, uh, so perhaps if you have a strong personality that isn't, um, recognizing that perhaps things aren't going the way they thought it was, um, by suggesting that you do a recap in that moment, can we recap this case would be a way of, um, presenting that opportunity to review what's going on and then providing that feedback in a professional way. A recap and a summary statement and a, um, a commitment to a plan going forward and also canvassing the team, including all the nurses for things that we might be missing is like critical. And it also is one of the best ways to establish that you are in fact the leader. But what about, what about if there's not a clear leader? What happens if you've got several physicians in particular, maybe a surgeon has come down to help you with the recess and all of a sudden now there's multiple leaders or an anesthetist is down there trying to do something with the airway and he's taken over and what do you what would you suggest then? You ask someone to identify themselves as the leader. Would you actually speak out and say, "Yes, it's not clear who the leader is. Could somebody please be identified as the leader? Is that what you would do yep. at that point in time? Yeah, that's happened to me before too. <laughs> <laughs> you forget, right? Like I've forgotten. I, you, you go in to do some advanced you know some sort of procedure like intubation, and all of a sudden there's nobody leading anymore. Yep. Because you're doing this procedure. Mm -hmm. and then you, you have your airway doctor, your procedure doctor, yeah. and then maybe some consultants come in too. And so who's actually leading this thing? Okay. So for a complex case or any case, really, you need to prepare. You need to be confident, but still be humble. You need to solicit everyone's opinion. You need to be clear with new people coming in what's going on. So there's the value of the recap. And I think that's Louise and Joe's recipe to resuscitation success. Mm. Good, good job, Louise. Tasty. So just this morning, I got an email, Joe, from uh, one of our, our nursing managers. And apparently it's time for Louise's annual nursing reappointment. Uh -huh. Yes. And so she asked if I would take care of that. And I said, yeah, I think we can fit that in. So it's straightforward. Louise just... Five questions. Um, definitely want type one responses. Okay. You ready? Okay. Double IPA or raspberry sour? Double IPA. Foley catheters. Coup de tip or no? Depends. I don't know if I take depends as an answer. That's not, that's a type two answer. Are you wearing depends these days? <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say. <laughs> Joe, I wear depends whenever I'm with you. I guess it depends For... where you, when, you, when you wear the depends. <laughs> All right. Uh, number three, poutine or tortillere? Poutine. All right. Eight hour or 12 hour shifts? A little bit of both. All right. I like that. Yeah, mix it up a bit for sure. All right. So this is the most telling question. So you arrive at the top of a long, untouched snow couloir with your ski touring companion. Who gets to drop in first? I think it depends again. I think it depends again. <laughs> 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 Are we inbounds or out of bounds? <laughs> inbounds me for sure. Out of bounds, they can go first. All right, excellent. Um, I don't think I think Ruth will be happy with those answers. I'll pass them on to her. So the the mandate of the BC Emergency Medicine Network is exceptional emergency care everywhere. So how do you think nursing relates specifically to that? So I think it doesn't matter if you're working in a small rural site or in a big urban center, the care that's being provided should be across the board amazing. My only experience is in busy urban centers. So I would say the same thing, that it doesn't matter where you are working in the emergency room, whether you're up at triage or you're in recess or you're the PCC, um, that there is this baseline standard of care that we should all be following. Um, and that, that is something that nurses strive for as well. And that we need support to do that. But, um, once we're well supported that we're, 
um, fully capable of kind of providing that excellence. Oh, that sounds excellent. So I'm just thinking of what we talked about for the balance of the day. And it makes me think that a lot of our priorities and issues are actually the same. And we can strengthen our bonds and relationships with each other by doing things both at work and out of work. So, Joe, any last words about the intersection of emergency physician and emergency nursing care? Well, the common path is giving really good quality care to the patients, and that's the the common goal. And we're just a big team that uh, collects uh, data and provides care together to make the patient's uh, experience hopefully really good and and good quality. And it's just really important to be, like I really, really appreciate our eMERGE nurses. I can speak for Eric too. We all just love our eMERGE nurses and our job, we couldn't do the job without them. I, yeah, I would just like to finish with that, that I love my colleagues. I love the physicians that I work with, but also the whole interdisciplinary team. They're absolutely amazing. They make going to work uh, a joy. And now I'm just really excited to be in this new position as a PCC and hopefully being able to serve my, uh, my colleagues and the patients. Hey, Louise, thanks for taking the time and thanks. talking to us about the importance of nursing and how it affects our patients and how it affects our relationships with each other. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Time to wrap it up and call it a day. Thanks for tuning in. Feel free to post your comments and feedback on the BC Emergency Medicine Network website, bcemn.ca, and take a moment to check out the Clinical Resources tab with its clinical summaries and procedural videos, and visit the lounge to join in on member discussions, open up blogs, and access the End of Shift podcast library. Thanks to the network, and especially to Carolyn McKinnon, our editor extraordinaire. Until then, keep your differential wide and go play outside.